Welcome everyone to lecture 9 of this uh, series. These lectures accompany and explain my book manual of fluid, electrolytes, and acid-base disorders, a pathophysiologic approach to common clinical problems. I am Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I am a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. Well, first, congratulations on making it this far. If you've been watching from the beginning, it means that you have survived hyponatremia. And now, in this lecture, we're going to talk about something exciting, which is hypernatremia. This is the book, and you can find it on Amazon. It's uh, available as uh, an ebook or a paperback, and you can find more information in the description. We are still on chapter one of the book, Disorders of Water Balance, Hyponatremia and Hypernatremia. And this lecture is Hypernatremia Part 1. Introduction. Hypernatremia is seen in patients who do not have ready access to water. People with ready access to water, they're not going to get hypernatremic. Why? Because they are going to drink. So when are we going to see hypernatremia? We're going to see it in infants because obviously they cannot get up and go to the refrigerator and get themselves a glass of water. People who are incapacitated, especially when their thirst mechanism is not intact, this is what we call hypodipsia. People on parenteral nutrition, this is very common in the hospital because uh, sometimes you're not giving them enough water with the parenteral nutrition. People on loop diuretics, this is also very common. Sometimes the patient stops drinking water, but uh, the patient continues to take their loop diuretics and end up with hypernatremia. Patients in the ICU, again, they cannot get up and drink water. Hypernatremia is indicative of a severe illness with multiple comorbidities. So hypernatremia is more than just an elevated sodium. It means that the person is probably incapacitated, that the person has a thirst mechanism that is not intact, that they cannot get up and drink and do other things. So it means that we really have a sick patient. Now, thirst is important. Thirst resulting from hypernatremia or hyperosmolality in, ge in general is a very powerful force. If I give someone with free access to water 3% saline and artificially raise that person's sodium, they're going to go and drink. And this is a very powerful drive. So this prevents hypernatremia in people who are community dwelling with access to water. Now, what about the mechanism? Go back to lecture one of this series. We said when we have hyponatremia or hypernatremia, we have this imbalance between sodium and water. And we said, generally speaking, in hypernatremia, we have too little water. However, sometimes you can have too much sodium, but usually it's a decrease in water. So it's possible that, that in some cases you're going to have an increase in both sodium and water, but more sodium. But generally speaking, 90% of the times when you're going to see hyponatremia, think of dehydration. Think that the patient doesn't have access to free water. Think that there is a decrease in the free water portion. Okay. Some ICU patients have hypernatremia with hypervolemia. So, so these patients have an increase in their water and an increase in their sodium, but there is more sodium than water. This is less common, okay? And this happens in patients when we give them hypertonic intravenous solutions. Uh, say we are resuscitating someone and we keep the, giving them uh, sodium bicarbonate. Not that it is a good idea, but sometimes it, it is done. If you're giving multiple ampules of sodium bicarb, you can create uh, hypernatremia. What about diabetes insipidus? This is an important category because, not because it's very common, but because failure to recognize it is a big problem. Now, as you know from long time ago, diabetes insipidus or DI can be central or nephrogenic. When it's central, it can be partial or complete. Now, when are we going to have central diabetes insipidus? From the name central, it's related to what? The central nervous system. So head injury, brain tumors, uh, brain surgery is, is a big, big category. 
Some cases are idiopathic. Sometimes you don't know. Sometimes you see it after brain surgery, but it is transient. It goes away. Few cases, 10% of cases, this is not common, are hereditary, and it can be autosomal dominant or recessive. And anything hereditary you're going to see in children. Now, nephrogenic DI, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, is more common than central diabetes insipidus. And this is uh, the result of impaired response to vasopressin or ADH by the renal tubules. So the collecting tubule does not respond to ADH, and therefore you're going to have what? Water diuresis. So you're going to have nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So there is vasopressin. The pituitary, the posterior pituitary, is making vasopressin or ADH, but the kidneys, the collecting tubules, are not responding. When do you see that? Now, this is important. Um, these three, four causes, please remember them. Hypokalemia, so low potassium, hypercalcemia, high calcium, sickle cell disease, and renal amyloidosis. Of the medications, the most important by far is lithium. So these patients many times uh, come in, say, with hypercalcemia, and they start to have DI, and they come in with what? Dehydration, and then their BUN creatinine go up, so now they're in acute kidney injury. Uh, there are also cases of hereditary nephrogenic DI, DI, like we said, there are also central DI cases that are hereditary, but this is rare. Now, let's look uh, in more details about the causes of hypernatremia. We said 90% of the time is going to be due to dehydration, water loss. So high sodium is due to little water. Go back to chapter one and look at, uh, at the slide with the three glasses of, of water. Now, when do we see dehydration? Well, as you know, you can see that with osmotic diarrhea, when you lose more water than solutes. Very commonly, you see dehydration from loop diuretics, furosemide, bumetanide, torsemide, especially when, when the patient is dehydrated, someone has diarrhea, they take furosemide for edema or congestive heart failure, and they continue to take their medication, but they stop drinking water. Now, patients with central or nephrogenic DI, normally, they have a serum sodium at the upper range of normal, maybe 144, 145, 146. But if their access to water is cut off, this is when you're going to see full-blown diabetes insipidus, and this is when you're going to see hypernatremia. So someone with, say, central DI or nephrogenic DI, maybe they're making three, four liters of, of urine, and they're used to drinking that much. So they're compensating. Now they're admitted to the hospital to have surgery done, and they're put MPO, they have no access to water, and then you're going to get hypernatremia. So pay attention to that. Medications can do it. Uh, the top of the list, list by far is lithium, but other medications can, uh, can do it. Amphotericin B, afloxacin, uh, uh, foscarnet, clonazepine, uh, cydofovir, um, Orlistat, this is the medicine used for uh, obesity. Demeclocycline, we said in the past they used this for treatment of SIADH, and again, it should not be used. Now, osmotic diuresis, like osmotic diarrhea, can cause hypernatremia, like when you have patients with hyperglycemia and they start urinating a lot, um, or uh, mannitol. Mannitol nowadays is used less often. Hypothalamic lesions that affect thirst, so the patient doesn't feel thirst, this is very rare. Um, so th this should not be on the top of your differential diagnosis uh, list. It should be way, way in the bottom. Um, enteral feeding is very common, especially if free, free water administration is deficient. So whenever you start patient on enteral feeding, start some free water. Maybe start 100 ml every four to six hours and go from there. Check serum sodium daily, check a basic metabolic panel daily, and adjust how much free water uh, you want to give. Can you have hypernatremia from too much sodium? Yes, but it's less common. Usually, again, it's too little water. You can have it due to sodium gain, like I said, if you are giving hypertonic intravenous solutions, sodium bicarbonate, 3% saline, especially to infants or people in the intensive care unit. Acute salt poisoning, believe it or not, that sometimes can happen due to suicide attempt or it could be accidental. And if you're giving a hypertonic feeding solutions without giving enough water, you can see it. 
Another category that is important, and you see that a lot, uh, people come in with congestive heart failure and you're aggressively diuresing them with the furosemide, and then they start to have hypernatremia, but they're still fluid overloaded. Meaning in this case, we have excess water and excess sodium, but now we have more sodium than water. So what do we do? Do we stop the diuretics, which cause the hypernatremia? No, because they're still fluid overloaded. So you continue the loop diuretic, and then you can give D5W. You could also give a thiazide diuretic, so you lose some sodium. And uh, in, in two, three days, usually things will balance out. What are the manifestations of hypernatremia? Well, the symptoms of any electrolyte disturbance, they're kind of similar and nonspecific. You cannot say, well, the patient has malaise, fatigue, weakness, and agitation, so the patient must have hypernatremia. No, this is common to almost any electrolyte disturbance. Symptoms can, again, progress to seizures, metabolic encephalopathy, and coma. Once you reach a serum sodium of 180, the mortality is high, even if you correct it properly. Why? Because it means the person is really sick. It means that you have so many comorbid conditions. Again, to reiterate, severe hypernatremia is associated with significant comorbidities. How do we correct hypernatremia? Now, when we want to correct hypernatremia, we have to estimate, we have to to determine the total amount of free water needed to correct hypernatremia. So we have three components. Insensible water loss, which is about 0.8 liter per day, but it could be more if someone is on a ventilator, for example, if someone has a tracheostomy, etc. We add that to electrolyte free water clearance, okay, and please see hyponatremia part five, uh, that uh, lecture, uh, preferably part four and five, and I'm going to put a link in the description to those lectures. If you don't know what electrolyte free water clearance is, please see that. But basically to calculate it, we need to know urine sodium, urine potassium, and plasma sodium, and urine volume, and then you use the equation you see on the screen easily to calculate electrolyte free water clearance. So in essence, we're calculating how much free water exists in the urine. So we're adding insensible water loss plus how much the patient is putting out in terms of free water, and then we're adding the free water deficit, how much the patient has lost already. And then we add the three together. So again, volume of free water needed to be replaced equals insensible water loss plus electrolyte free water clearance plus free water deficit. If you just calculate one component, then you're not going to have good correction, okay? The patient will not recover as fast. So the water loss formula or the free water deficit formula, this is the water that everyone, this is the formula that everyone learned uh, when, when they were students. Water deficit equals current total body water, current, okay? Not uh, before the hypernatremia happened. We use the current total body water. And if we know current serum sodium, we divide that by 140 minus one multiplied by total body water. So if we have someone who weighs 70 kilograms, a man, uh, then total body water is approximately 42 liters. And if serum sodium is 160, the water deficit is six. Now, this water deficit is not all that we need to replace. We have to add to that 0.8 of insensible water per 24 hours. And then we have to add electrolyte free water clearance, how much he's putting out for a day. And then we get an idea about the total amount of water needs to be replaced, and then we replace it over two to three days. Hopefully you're not going to give seven or eight liters in the first 24 hours. So uh, you're going to do it uh, gradually. Now, finally, let's look at the equation differently. Now, what, what I did here, I rearranged this equation, okay? Uh, uh, so with a little bit of algebra, we can determine how much water we need to reach a desired serum sodium. Because the six liter I told you about is how much the total, how, how much free water deficit we have. But this is not just the information you need. What if you have a serum sodium of, one, uh, of say 150 and you wanna decrease it to 140? How much water do you need? So this, this equation that I came up with may be useful. So 
we here also we take current total body water but we determine how much the current sodium is and the desired sodium is we divide that by 140 and we multiply with total body water easy enough for example let's say that we have a woman 60 kilogram and her total body water is 30 and she presented with serum sodium of 176 based on this equation based on the, uh, the equation on the previous slide the total water deficit is 7.7 .7 liter but i don't want to give 7.7 .7 liter on day one i want to correct the sodium just to 166 so i want to correct it by 10 for example so then the water needed is 2.14 what do we add again electrolyte free water clearance and then insensible losses and we divide that so it's going to come out come to about uh, 125 150 ml uh, per hour then the next day you look at the sodium you determine your new target you use the same formula and you go from there now i'm going to uh, stop here and in the in the next lecture we're going to continue talking about hypernatremia